Hi everyone. You can see already people here. Hi Fidelis. Thank you for joining us. Let me know if you can hear me well in the comments. Thank you, Eugene. Yes, you're all looking forward to learning more. <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. All right. So, Phyllis, in the interest yes. of time, because I know I yes. have another engagement, I'll just get straight into it. Yeah. No problem. Um, just give me a moment. Yeah. Okay. All right, so thank you to all who joined us today. Feel right at home. Uh, say hi in the comments. Let us know uh, what questions you may have. We have a, a rather short session today because Phyllis has another engagement that had been scheduled for us. So um, please try and get yours in early. Um, I'd love to also know where you're joining us from. Please let us know. I'm Beryl, and I'm the founder and MD of the Angles and North Limited, and I'm also the host of After Hours. And after hours is our um, interview talks with African leaders and we just get to learn their career stories, their journey, and just get inspired and challenged. So at Angle North, what we do is we connect the top 1% of current and aspiring leaders to the very best opportunities. And we look at what it is that they are a great match for. And it's, it's uh, different from the putting in that we provide that much better match and at lower cost than traditional recruiting. So if you're a HR lead or a talent lead or a CEO who's looking for your next leader, do get in touch. I'd be happy to assist. Today's guest is Phyllis Wakiaga. Phyllis is the CEO of CAM, which is the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And the mission of Kenya Association of Manufacturers is to promote competitive and sustainable local manufacturing. She's an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and was a master's in international trade and investment law and a master's in business management. And she's currently study, studying for her PhD. Phyllis also serves as the UN Global Compact Network Kenya Chapter Board Chair and uh, the Kenya Industrial Water Alliance Chair and is a member of the Kenya COVID-19 Fund Board and represents CAM in a number of institutions including the Commercial Business Council, the East African Community Manufacturers Network and the Anti-Counterfeit Agency and the Anti-Illicit Trade Multi-Agency Forum, amongst others. She's a member of the Law Society of Kenya, the Institute of Human Resource Management, the Institute of Directors, and the Institute of Economic Affairs. Phyllis has received multiple awards and been recognized by organizations, including Top Africa Economic Leader for Tomorrow by Shwazul, 100 Africa List, and one of the 2019 Most Influential People of African Descent Global 100 under 40. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Phyllis Wakiaga. Welcome Phyllis, so glad to have Thanks. you today. Thank you. Yeah, so I think, um, let's start off, there was an interview you were doing today with uh, KTN, and you gave a couple yes. of uh, highlights of the year. <laughs> yeah. So maybe give, give us some of those highlights. Um, thanks, thanks a lot, Beryl, and thanks for hosting me on your show. Um, yes, today I was doing an interview with KTN. Uh, basically, they were taking stock of what 2021 has been, um, what it has been for the manufacturing sector, how the recovery has gone uh, after 2020. So we did have discussions on the issues around how COVID had impacted on the sector and what the recovery has been like in 2021 for the sector. We also discussed issues of the opportunities within the manufacturing sector that have emerged uh, out of COVID and what has been happening globally. And mm -hmm. um, just the outlook for what 2022 looks like. Um, so it's been a mixed bag, I guess, for the sector. There are sectors that have performed well in the last two years uh, because of the new opportunities that have emerged in the market uh, based on the uh, shifting supply chain, the new products like PPEs and hygiene products that were required yeah. in the market. But of course, we've seen other businesses like SME struggle. We've also seen challenges in the global supply chains, which I think mm -hmm. on the other hand poses as an opportunity because 
it does mean that people will be reconsidering where they source their goods from and trying to diversify their source markets. Um, mm -hmm. Africa, uh, where we see uh, the opportunity is that as people shift their global sourcing markets, Africa will be a beneficiary of this. So how do we position mm -hmm. our local manufacturing and industrial sector so that we are able then to become a source market to supply the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. And beyond that, we have the AFCTA, which I think is a big opportunity also for Africa to manufacture more for the African market. So, yeah, that's part of uh, our thoughts as we come to the end of this uh, year, 2021. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And definitely, I, I think I, I was watching um, a story and, you know, a lot of people were saying we need to hedge from our traditional sourcing markets yeah, because we, this is just not... Uh, it's too much of a risk that we hadn't anticipated. So that's a great opportunity. I like that. Yeah, all right. Great. So today is all about you <laughs> and your career <laughs> and your leadership journey. Um, so yes. start us off from your, your first job. What were you doing? What were you being paid? Well, my first job was at Student Campaign Against Drugs. That is SCAD. Mm -hmm. um, I started working for SCAD when I finished high school. Um, as a peer counselor, so they when they would normally do a recruitment process after high school and um, end up with about ten um, uh, peer counselors and then train us for three months. Then after that, we would go into working for SCAD. At that time, the main work was um, just advocating and campaigning against drugs, going to schools, speaking to students um, about the um, effects of utilizing. Uh, drugs. And then we would also volunteer at Chiromolen Medical Center uh, because one of the board directors uh, was Dr. Frank Njenga. So yeah. I had a lot of experience just dealing with um, advocating and speaking to uh, young people about um, the challenges of drug abuse and also supporting um, um, uh, patients at the Chiromolen Medical Center. So we'd volunteer in the kitchen and just basically support um, at, at, at the center. Yeah, so that's what, that was my first job. Um, and it was interesting because I hadn't gone to campus yet. It was right after high school. So as the rest of my friends were um, probably waiting to join campus, at least I was earning a little money. Um, I think we used to get, was it 4,000 shillings a week or something like that? But it was good enough money for our bus fare to eat chips. And then in the late 90s, I think that was a lot of money. So yeah, it was a good thing. And it kept us busy and at job. least out of trouble. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. That was Which a really good. good job. Yeah. Oh, okay. so you think? I think, yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that. I think you're probably my second most highly paid guest. Yeah. Oh, Lawrence the first was, job. Yes. Lawrence was like, ah, oh, I was paid 20,000. Like 20,000 for your first That's salary. A lot of money. Oh, yeah. A money. My yeah. first salary was. 3,000 a month, yeah. <laughs> the whole month, that's exploitation. That's not a salary. <laughs> and I was a manager too, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. But anyway, yeah, that's the thing about first yeah. jobs. Yeah. Huh? Right. Yes. So then what did you do after that? So I know you, you uh, had a short stint at a law firm. No, after that I went to campus because CAD was mm -hmm. between, you know, we had like a two year. We, You know, nowadays I see students after high school saying they're going to have a gap year. Us girls had two gap years by force because we would finish uh, high school in October and you only got admitted to campus two years later in September. So we actually had two gap years and that's when I worked at, at, at SCAD. So after that, mm -hmm. I went to University of Nairobi. Um, I was admitted to study Bachelor of Laws. Yeah, so spent four years studying um, law at the University of Nairobi, which was quite interesting. And then, of course, doing everything around a law degree. So in second year, we had to do our clinicals uh, where we were placed be below a magistrate. So I was um, be below, I worked with Justice Maureen Odera at um, uh, the, high, the, the high court in town. And then at Milimani, I worked under Justice Meoli. So for my mm -hmm. clinicals, that's where I did my clinicals, which is basically practicing at court within the court. Then when I finished, I went to Tieno Muga and Oma Advocates, 
um, as I transitioned between um, my pupillage after university. Um, yeah, the time we did law, our year we had to go to Kenya School of Law. The years before had resisted, but by the time it got to our year, um, I guess the, it now became mandatory that after uh, finishing law school, you would have to go to Kenya School of Law. So in that year, I spent um, that year um, at Kenya School of Law. Uh, we would have classes half day and you'd need to be attached to a law firm to finalize now your your pupillage. So that's what I did for that period of, of, of time. And um, after that, um, I thought I wanted to diversify and in the meantime, I, I started pursuing a higher diploma in human resource management uh, because mm -hmm. I was clear from early on that I, did, I didn't want to just be a law student or a lawyer or a courtroom mm -hmm. lawyer or an advocate. I wanted probably to get into the corporate world. Yeah, so I, I started doing a higher diploma in human resource management at the Institute of Human Resource Management. Yeah, so that's what I did. Uh, for a year, the higher diploma takes a year. So between my pupillage and the higher diploma, spent a year doing that. And um, that year I was also, as I said, I, I knew I didn't want to practice. So I started looking for opportunities in the corporate world. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, one of the places you'll start with is the banking sector. So I applied for a number of jobs in the banking sector and got called by Copbank to, um, to, to go and do some work there. And at that point, we were, we were called quite a number of us, and then we, we mm. went to Copbank in Upper Hill and um, were taken to the basement of the building and basically put in a room to cut shareholder checks and file and put mm. them in envelopes <laughs> for like mm. almost two or three weeks. Um, so yeah, we did that and a number of us decided not to do it. So by the time it was two days later, I think we were just about five of us left. So we did that for two weeks. And then after that, got invited for a proper interview. Um, yeah, so I got a job offer at that time from Copbank and then Stanchart and KQ, because I also applied for a job mm -hmm. in KQ. So that's how I got into KQ. Um, uh, for They were looking for a lawyer for their, their claims and, and customer relations department. Um, so yeah, that's how I got into KQ. Okay. Yeah. And so now this transition from KQ to CAM, I mean, yeah, quite something. <laughs> what was, yeah, what was yeah. that like for you? Yeah. Um, KQ was nice because I think aviation was is, is an exciting sector. I still think it's exciting. Yeah. Because uh, you learn a lot of new things, you learn about global aviation sector. At that time, handling claims, you get to understand the policies that govern uh, global travel. Um, we we were looking a lot at business process improvement based on customer feedback. So just giving input to the business uh, on customer feedback and areas of improvement that they could look into, which I think yeah. was was it was very exciting because you got to understand the business end to end how the customer received the product. Um, we were also able to deal with a number of sensitive cases and claims that mm -hmm. arose against the airline. Um, and, and it was an interesting time. Then um, after working at in, in, in that department for three years, I got an opportunity to move to the government and industry affairs department. So that's where my work with public policy and government relations um, started. I was the coordinator for government and industry affairs. So working with um, the Ministry of Transport, the Kenya Civil Aviation Authority, the Kenya mm -hmm. Airports Authority, so the different government bodies around the aviation sector. Um, I also used to get involved in negotiation of bilateral air service agreements with the different mm -hmm. countries that we have agreements with and participate in ICAO, that's the International Civil Aviation Organization. So they are, uh, represent KQ uh, within, within that organization. So within time, I also got promoted to be the manager for the government and industry um, affairs team. Yeah, so that's, that's I think, where my, my uh, work and interest in public policy, in government relations, stakeholder relations, 
um, that's where that work began at, at KQ. Mm -hmm. So by the time I was transiting to come, it was more of transiting from aviation to manufacturing, but in the space of government relations and public policy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead in just in the interest of time. So for those joining us, um, I'm interviewing Phyllis Wakiaga. She's the CEO of CAM. Now today's session, we're going to, it's going to be a little shorter than we'd have hoped. But you, Phyllis has a friend. You can, you can stretch it to 7.30 latest. I've, I've okay. not asked someone to chair the meeting, to start right, off the meeting. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but yeah. please ask your questions um, in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from, comment. Yeah, take part. Okay. So then now I can go back <laughs> a little bit yeah, on that. So what was it like transitioning from aviation to manufacturing and especially in an area like public policy where you have to have a you know quite in-depth um, knowledge of the regulatory affairs and, and things like that uh for me it was interesting because i love learning so i i always love new challenges and new information so moving from aviation to manufacturing meant that i had to now wrap my mind around a different set of of, of legislative framework and policy yeah. In, in, in aviation, you're, govern, you're, you're dealing more with the Montreal Conv Convention, the Yamasukro Declaration, and the different bilateral air service agreements uh, that govern um, the, the, the policy and, 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 and um, the business environment. Uh, so that's a very different set of instruments. Uh, when, you, when I moved into manufacturing, uh, what, what was now the main thing, it was mainly around manufacturing and industrial policy, and trade policy and legislation around um, trade and industry and taxation because a lot of what we do is also in that area. So for me, it was exciting and interesting learning curve, um, mm -hmm. just understanding uh, the dynamics within the sector and everything around that. So in, in KQ, when I joined KQ, one of the things much, I, I did HR, but one of the things you learn quickly when you get into business as a lawyer and you're not in a legal department is that all you learn in campus as a lawyer is law and that's a fact so i decided to do a master's in business administration so that i can learn more about business uh, so got exposed to finance marketing economics you know the different aspects of business which was really really good so at least i got to hone my business mind uh through through practice and also through theory by by doing a master's in business so when I went to come, now for that learning curve, I realized that I need to understand international trade investment, you know, the the, the 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 space within manufacturing and trade. So that's when I did a master's in international trade and investment law um, when I joined CAM. Because I quickly realized, hey, it's, it's important to hone my um, skills and knowledge in that area. Yeah, so it, it, was, it was a good learning curve um, and with the team I was working with, a lot of people had been in the sector for a long time. So mm -hmm. they were very, very useful in just getting me up to speed, sharing information and and really supporting. And um, at that time, the CEO, uh, current CS, Betty Maina, I was reporting to her and she was an amazing mentor, had a lot mm -hmm. of experience in industry. So I learned a lot from her also. Oh, that's awesome, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. And so now when you when the opportunity came to become CEO, was there any yeah. glimmer of doubt in your mind? <laughs> um, I love a challenge. So when mm -hmm. the board approached me and asked me if I could um, uh, take over a CEO designate, it was a great challenge. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm one of those people who says yes and then learns how to do it as quickly as possible. <laughs> yeah, so I, <laughs> I don't that. say no yeah. to anything, yeah. So I believe that, um, yeah, you can always learn, you can always um, get get people around you also because you're working in a team, you're not working alone. So there'll be experts in different areas and what you'll really be doing is playing the role of uh, being a leader. And being a leader is really just inspiring, influencing, motivating, opening doors, uh, building relationships. So I was, I was sure I could do that. So yeah, I... I jumped at the opportunity mm -hmm. okay yes and what you do i think one of the biggest things for me is that you were very young when you joined uh 
has come see oh okay you still love me yes <laughs> am i still but, young i don't know yes you are you know so i'm just thinking how I did you that. go about because there were people i'm sure there were people who were you know older than you had been in the organization longer had probably been looking at the exact same job and yeah. were waiting for it you know with bated breath you know so how do you do how do you transition especially as a younger leader someone who's new and people are like what's she going to do <laughs> okay yeah uh, um the good thing yeah. is i had been in cam for 2 years already mm-hmm. and uh proved my competence at the role i had been given so i think as long as you're credible and competent yeah. um that's one step towards it because as head of policy i was able to do quite a lot of uh, new things the board were quite happy with the work i had done as head of policy um secondly i'd also built relationships amongst the heads of unit so my peers were people i was working well with we had a good working relationship um by and large and uh, mm-hmm. that made it easier so when when i ascended to ceo a lot of them were quite supportive and um played a, a very important role in ensuring that we continued to grow the organization um mm-hmm. even under my leadership and then also the rest of the team so i think just that ability to um give the confidence to people that you recognize the work they do because as i say it as a leader you're not doing the work alone there are experts in different areas doing their work so if you're able to demonstrate to them that you'll give them room to do their work and do it well if you're able to support them if you're able to also have competence in 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 your areas of expertise i think it gives confidence to um the people that you lead absolutely yeah mm. yeah giving people the space and just trusting them right yeah okay and what about now for example the <clears throat> the manufacturers themselves the ceos yeah these are huge personalities <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, yeah and, no. and for example i'm just thinking some people were probably like ah feelings no let's go right and others are like no let's go left some are like let's just stay here where we are how do you balance mm. especially as a young leader you know how do you go yeah. about it um looking back it's now 7 years later um looking back i think one of the main things as i said the fact that first i came as a competent person to the role i was hired um through a competitive process even for the head of policy research and advocacy unit and i delivered uh within that role so i think that gave them confidence that i knew what i was doing And then the other thing about Kenya Association of Manufacturers we have an extremely supportive board. So I have a board of 18 members. All of them are either CEOs or business owners and all of them are competent and very different in their approach to how they run their businesses. So that diversity and and a number of them being people who started their businesses when they were very young also and had grown their businesses they had confidence in 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 what they were doing and they knew that they would be there along the way also to to support and give direction so i think just having that kind of a board um and working closely with the board also led to um the the growth and the success we've seen in the organization over the last 7 years mm-hmm. that's awesome and i think that's one of the things for me that's uh really important to so having like a really supportive structure around you as a leader but i'm just thinking okay some people yes. are probably thinking okay so what happens if let's say you yes. don't have that support structure yeah because there are some young leaders <laughs> of course and maybe yeah. your boy is kind of like we are 50 50 about you we are not sure we're giving you a chance but we're not sure yeah. how would you go about building that uh sense of credibility and rapport with them so you work effectively I think first of all for a board to trust anyone to be a CEO the board has to have confidence in that person that's a first step and if they don't they are better off not giving that role to the person because they'll be second guessing themselves all through and it's not good for the organization yeah. so it's important that a board takes a call when they have confidence that the person can do the job maybe the person is not 100% ready to do the job perfectly at the beginning but that the person with the right um support system with the right um infrastructure will be able to deliver so it has to start from the place that you're recruiting a competent person 
So you can't recruit an incompetent person and then expect competence or, or results. So it starts from there. But once a board has given you a job, that's an indication that they believe in your competence. So it's then to see how you can steer the organization um, and drive its strategy. So first of all, I think as, as, as a CEO or um, the secretariat, at least in our part has come, we are driving a strategy that is coming from the board. So the strategy does not come from us. It comes from our members. It comes from the board. Then we translate it into a three-year strategy document, which we eventually break down into annual work plans. So when that clarity is there, um, you're, you're developing strategy. Of course, we do it alongside the unit. So it's, it's both bottom up and top down. But once the clarity on the strategy is there, it's easier then for a CEO to work together with her team and the board to achieve the strategy. So I think if, if you follow that path, it, 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 it makes a lot of sense. And then the other thing is in whatever institution you are in, to see how you can continuously strengthen your governance structures. So in CAM over the last seven years, that's what we've continued to strengthen. Uh, look at the organs within our governance structure. So the board, how do we ensure the board has its meetings? Our board sits six times a year. So every two months we have to sit. How do we ensure that we have a board charter in place, which is what we've worked on in the last uh, in, 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 over, in the last few years. So we have a board charter. We have committee charters. We have committees with clear TORs. They meet before the board, deliberate and escalate items for approval and discussion and direction to the board. So if you have proper governance structures as a CEO, it also helps you to run an institution effectively. Okay. okay. So, so if, if someone is in a situation like that, where maybe they, yes. they're constantly feeling like they're uh, berated for their age or something, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it's just to do the work as best as you can, but if it really gets out of hand, then just, just let it go. Like if they can't yeah. trust you. If they can't trust you, and they shouldn't put you there if they don't trust you, and if they don't trust yeah. you, then you shouldn't be there. So it's just one of those things. And secondly, I don't think age has anything to do with anything, because if you look at people like mm -hmm. even Mwaikibaki, Kiram people like Mudavadi, these are people who are ministers in their 20s. So sometimes when people tell us <laughs> that we achieved things when we were young, we're doing these things in our 30s. There are people who are ministers in their 20s. So, yeah, so I think it's, exactly. yeah, it's, yeah, there are people who are billionaires in even their early 20s and are running uh, global businesses. So I think... Hi, Beryl. Beryl, I think I lost you. Let me drop off and come back in.
Can you hear me? Okay, I can't hear you clearly, my dear. I can I can see you talking, but I can't hear anything. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Let me try to log off and come back. I can hear you now. Okay, great, great. Very sorry about that. Yeah, we just okay. had an issue no. with the streaming software. Okay, okay. not a problem. Um, all right, so you were just explaining a little bit about the... Uh, I'm trying to remember, where did we stop, Phyllis? Um, we were speaking about the issue of leadership and um, what, kinds of, what kind of structures you'd need to set up and if at all... Um, you were hired and people were looking down or not working well with you yes. because you were young, especially a board that has given you the mandate um, that that should really not happen in the first place. Because by the time a board trusts someone with a role, it should be someone they believe is competent to carry it out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so we're just saying that if it was, if, if per chance they don't yes. feel that way, even though you've tried then you should just let it go. Like you shouldn't, yeah, you shouldn't take too fast. long in that situation. Yeah, you shouldn't yeah. take too long. Of course, yeah. Try. yeah, yeah. You, you, would, you would know if, um, if, if you're having those challenges and there's the lack of trust. Mm -hmm. So it's something, you don't want to be in a situation where people don't trust you and you've been given a role. So it should come Absolutely. from a place of, by the time we're giving you a role, we trust that you can do it. And we are supporting you to do it because... A supportive board, I think, is everything. If you're working in an institution or driving an institution, if you have Absolutely. that shared and common vision with the board, of course, there's a there's the there's the creative tension that's required between a board and management um, for mm -hmm. governance to function. But it doesn't go beyond that. By and large, the board should be able to trust its leadership team to deliver. Yeah, and if they don't, it should change the leadership team. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we have a question here from Adol Lorata. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, at Phyllis, how was your experience the first time you got a chance to take up a leadership position or managerial position? Um, uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, I'm one of those people who have always volunteered to be a leader. So anytime there's who wants to lead me, who wants to mm -hmm. support in coordinating anything. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm I, I, I don't believe leadership is a position. I, I believe it's it's uh, uh, the ability to influence. So you can influence mm -hmm. from any position, even if you don't have mm -hmm. the title. So I've always been that kind of a leader. And I think for that reason, leadership came to me at a, a, a title leadership came to me at an early age. I was manager before I was 30 at, at, at KQ. 
Um, and uh, for, for, for that reason, I think um, it was an interesting curve because of course you're having to learn and hone new skills because when you get into leadership or management position, you have higher responsibilities. Um, you're driving, um, whether it's a unit, a department, delivery. Yeah. So it goes beyond just you doing your job, but it's also about how you relate with others because you're also getting your, your work done through people and also how you collaborate uh, because mm -hmm. for leaders, for managers, it's, it's, it's never about now your silo and your specific job, but about how as a greater uh, group of leaders, you're able to drive a strategy for an organization forward. So it sort of just mm -hmm. changes. It's, it's a change in mindset from the doing to actually getting things done through people, to driving collaboration, to building relationships, to supporting others also to, to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. also building new skill sets because in a lot of cases, when you get into management or leadership, you have a cost center. So you're now learning also financial mm -hmm. skills. How do you manage the finances of the organization? How do you manage time? How do you manage performance? Uh, because you're now yeah. getting uh, teams to 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 drive performance of of your department, your unit, your organization. So it's higher responsibilities. Yeah. So for the first mm -hmm. time, it was it was a good learning curve um, to figure out what is the strategy. Because now you have to start thinking. Okay. So what's the strategy of this division? How does it fit into the larger strategy of at that time the network planning team? Because I was yeah. in government and industry, and it was part of a network planning team which was feeding into the commercial division of the airline. So it's now thinking beyond your own role, but to how your role fits into the ecosystem and then working across departments, sitting in meetings. Because the other thing about leadership is you then end up spending a lot of time in meetings because that's where yeah. people build consensus and, and, and arrive at joint decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Phyllis, I don't know, what are your thoughts about this? Um, like, I'm just thinking about Adolorata's question. And yeah. one of the things that comes to mind is reluctant leadership. Mm. You know, where someone feels they're in over their head. Yeah. I didn't quite, I, like, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm quite a people leader. Yeah. yeah. So do you think there's, there's such a thing? Like people who are not people leaders? Um, they're people because we have different personalities. They mm. are some of us who are more probably introverted or, or who yeah. prefer to work alone or get the work mm -hmm. done without necessarily mm -hmm. having to deal with people or drive people to deliver or drive people towards results. And you'll find there are people mm -hmm. in certain careers, like a lot of engineers don't like leadership. They'd rather just no. concentrate on, on doing their work. Or IT people. <laughs> yeah, you know, IT people or sometimes yeah. finance people. So there are certain careers which are more um, introverted or people are able to work on their own. Uh, but even for those, I found people in some of those careers who initially start off as reluctant leaders, uh, but over time with the right mentorship and coaching and training mm -hmm. and exposure, they're able to hone their leadership skills. So I think with, um, with, with all of us, uh, some of us are born leaders. Um, some of us need probably to um, be mentored, coached, convinced uh, that yeah. we, 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 we can be leaders and supported to lead. So it depends on the personality, but um, it depends on not going people make good leaders or mm -hmm. that all introverts are not good leaders. I think you can build leadership skills irrespective mm -hmm. of your personality here. Yeah. Absolutely. And then just going yeah. back to reluctant leadership, I think one of the ones we hear a lot of, and I know yes. this is very true as well for the women in manufacturing program, yeah. um, that there are not enough women leaders <laughs> in top <laughs> positions. Yeah. And then, you know, on one hand, uh, we have that. But then on the other mm -hmm. hand, I've had people say, oh, yeah, but in fact, even when we tell people, the ladies to apply, they don't apply. They don't feel like they're ready. Yeah. So, Phyllis, maybe the question is, like, when is one ready? How did you know, okay, I'm ready to be CEO of CAM? Did it just, like, dawn on you? Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, my belief has always been that I'm always ready. As I've told you, anytime there's an opportunity to lead, I'm the first one to put up my hand. Who wants yeah. to volunteer? I will volunteer. 
So even yeah. I remember the time I applied for the job at KQ, I looked at the application. I still have that newspaper ad to date in my in my folder at home. And I laughed yeah. because I, I was those people who, when I was looking for a job in the corporate world, I applied for any job, whether I qualified or not. If they write 10 years experience, I apply. If they yeah, write, like God knows what I apply. I'm of, <laughs> I will apply. If they shortlist yeah. me, I will go and convince them I can do the job. Yeah. So I, I, at, at a personal level, I'm not reluctant. I believe in taking up risks, um, in yeah. taking up challenges, in showing up. Because you're right that very many people, sometimes even for women, you even overqualified for the role, but you're still second guessing yourself. Over, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't believe in that. I believe in showing up, saying that. I'll try. I will do the job. I will call me for the interview. I will prove. Give me the job. I will prove that I can do it. So that's my yeah. personality. It might not be everyone's, but um, for 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 those of us sometimes who feel we are not ready, I think show up, um, mm-hmm. make the application, get called for the interview. You know, go through the steps and get to a point. Okay, fine. I got this far, but we shouldn't shortchange ourselves or or cut ourselves out of consideration from the onset which unfortunately is something a lot of women do. And then men, on the other hand, someone will even be underqualified and he'll show up and say he can do it. (laughs) So I think that's a difference sometimes in our personalities. And um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't disqualify yourself on behalf of the interviewer. Just show up. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 20 years experience. Apply. Yeah, apply. apply. Let them be the ones to say no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's great. Okay, so we have another yeah. uh, comment here. Thank you, Miss Wakiaga, for sharing your impressive career journey and insights. Two questions to become CAM CEO as a job advertiser, or did the board appoint you based on your performance? So this was a competitive process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, um, so the, okay. Uh-huh. I can go ahead. I can go ahead. So the thing about come, I think come they like pre-planning and preparing for things. So I know like we always know who the incoming chair is. So you have a vice chair waiting to be chair ETC. So I think when um, um, the CEO's contract was almost coming to an end, one of the things they did was they tried to recruit the second level of people who would uh, be part of the succession plan. So three of us were recruited. Mm-hmm. Um, at that mm. time, someone to head the policy unit, someone to head operations, and someone to head the consulting arm. Um, so three of us were recruited as part of the succession planning as likely uh, people to take over from, from the CEO. By the time she was leaving, I was the only one still there. So mm. um, for that reason, that's how I then became CEO designate. So yeah, that's that's the process they went through to, to sort of just come up with a succession plan and identify a successor. And yeah, um, the CEO also played a critical arm in saying and, and working closely to mentor and develop uh, someone who would take over from her. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's very interesting. So a lot of organizations don't generally, uh, not, even, let me say, not say organizations, let me just say a lot of leaders find succession quite difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Is that something for you, what's that like? Like just making sure that there's always a continuous pipeline of good leaders. Um, for me, I also have a, a strong second team. And I think a lot of the time you'll mm-hmm. see even for interviews where CAM is being represented, it doesn't have to be me. I have a strong leadership team. So ensuring mm-hmm. that I delegate, I trust the people who report to me to do the job. Mm-hmm. I allow them to also take up responsibilities um, that that hone their 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 leadership skills that put them out there as mm-hmm. leaders. So I'm I'm, yeah. I'm I'm very confident that even within come today, we have a very strong leadership team, and it for succession planning into the future. And that's at leadership level, at management level. So we have uh, built leaders within the organization. We give everyone adequate exposure. Uh, we allow everyone to run fully with their work and 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 develop their 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 skills. So I think that mm-hmm. really um, ensures that even if you stay within an organization, that you have a strong team. Uh, and if you are to leave the organization because you have no certainty of the future, anything could happen to any of us, the organization is able to run in your absence. I remember mm-hmm. see you three years ago, I actually had to go on maternity leave um, for mm-hmm. over three months. 
And the organization ran quite well. Someone stood in for me for the three months. Mm -hmm. Life continued. The organization performed in my absence. Yeah. So I think it just demonstrated that in my absence, there is a strong team within the organization that can ensure the continuity of CAM. And beyond that, mm -hmm. also building strong governance structures uh, yeah. because you have a strong board, you have strong um, policies, systems, procedures that work independent of you uh, sitting and, 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 and having to do them yourself. So that helps an mm -hmm. institution uh, with continuity and succession. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a strong legacy. And everyone should aim for that, right? That the institution can run without you being there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the second question was looking back at your early career journey, what two or three things do you wish you knew about and would like to share with us beginning this journey? Wow, reflections. Number mm. one, I would save more and invest more. <laughs> I think okay. early on in, in, in your career, um, you don't realize that you can actually save and start to build wealth much more, much yeah. earlier. Yeah, yeah. I, did, I did a little, but I could have done much, much more. Um, that mm. discipline to put away, to save, to invest, I think is, is a discipline that... Um, if I was taken back to my 20s, I would, I would do much, much yeah. more of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, then the second thing is to continuously learn. Though it's something I've done, but it's something if you took me back to my 20s, I would do and do even much more. Just to be mm -hmm. open to learning, to not boxing yourself and saying, I am a lawyer or I'm an engineer or this and that. But yeah. saying, what more can I learn? How can I continue mm -hmm. to build myself? How can I continue to build my career? Um, how can I continue to have, just have as many options and 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 and, and do as much as possible uh, with mm. with 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 myself? So I think that's something else um, I would I would continue to do if I was taken back to my early career days. Um, what else mm. would I do? Mm. Okay, it's 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 been a, a a good ride pretty much for me. So. I think those are some of the things I would, I would, I would probably do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you ever imagine yourself going back to mainstream law practice? Practice? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. I would consult. I would do policy. I, I'm, I yeah. don't. I don't know about. I'm interested in practice as much. Yeah, though maybe I would, but it's not. <laughs> You never know. <laughs> and, and if I did it, I would not do it. Maybe I would do it from more of a constitutional law angle where I'd be looking mm -hmm. at the implementation of the constitution and, and things yeah. like that, or taxation law, now that yeah. I have a lot of interest in taxation. So maybe a different a different side mm -hmm. of it, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So we have got just a few minutes left. So if you have any question for Phyllis, please do ask before we close our session. So uh, what do you look for, you know, for you when you're hiring leaders? What, what, what's the core criteria that tells you this is someone that would be great to work with? Um, passion. Passion and integrity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And competence, always. So competence, yeah. passion, integrity, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell me how... Would, out of curiosity, how do you go about mm. measuring, especially the integrity part? Yeah, it's a very big thing. <laughs> <laughs> Even for me. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, over time, it's a sixth sense when you're mm -hmm. sort of having conversations with people. But also some of it is, luckily, there's a probation period when you hire anyone. Mm -hmm. So just from the behavior on the role, um, how they mm -hmm. relate with others, how they handle um, certain situations. Uh, within the mm. workplace, that could easily point you to um, the integrity of, of, of someone in the workplace, their beliefs, their value system. And when you work around people, you can you can easily pick uh, what that is. Yeah, and mm -hmm. over time, you, you, you learn how to uh, identify uh, that mm -hmm. in people. Yeah. Yeah. So have you ever... So let's, let's talk about some of the, the, the leadership issues that people yes. face. So uh -huh. have you ever had that problem, like uh, worked with someone, maybe not even within your team, right? Mm. Maybe as part of some uh, caucus of sorts, but you mm. work with someone who's 
unethical. And especially mm-hmm. if they're unethical and then they happen to also be very prominent <laughs> uh-huh. and powerful, you know, within that area, what would you do? What would you advise someone to do? Uh, for me, I think being ethical is a personal value. So you can't mm-hmm. control what other people's value systems are, but you can control mm-hmm. what your value systems are. So if you find mm-hmm. yourself in a situation of compromise, on matters integrity it should always be clear people should know that in black and white this is Beryl's position on these matters Absolutely. and in most cases when they know they won't even approach you on certain things so over time i think your character on certain things mm-hmm. uh, becomes evident and it becomes evident by the choices you make by how you carry mm-hmm. yourself out um by the mm-hmm. difficult positions you find yourself in and how you're able to stand up for for what yeah. is right so I think over time, when it becomes something you do continuously, people identify that that's your value system and, 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 and what you believe mm-hmm. in. Yeah, so it, it becomes then, mm-hmm. um, if someone is, is, is someone who doesn't have integrity, at least they know that when it comes to you, you have integrity. So they will then not either induce you to do things that are out of your value system, um, and mm-hmm. they will probably not do them in your sight or with your knowledge, because they know that you don't yeah. believe in or stand for uh, what they're doing. Mm-hmm. 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 One of the ones I see uh, people struggle with is, uh, so people feel sympathy for the person who doesn't have integrity. And I don't know if you've had feelings, people say, but if I report them, what will their kids eat? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I always ask myself, they know <laughs> that their kids are mm-hmm. supposed to eat. It's not you who's denying the food. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. the person makes the choice, right? So yeah. um, I think mm-hmm. part of also living in integrity is just being uh, honest um, mm. about the situation mm. when called upon. That's okay. True. Mm. And um, speaking about, you know, for example, for your situation, because you're, you're, you have to work with a lot of partners, you have to work with a lot of different teams and, and all that. What are some of the tips you can give people, especially when they're working with people who have got deeper, like more technical expertise than them? It's not, that is not deep, but they have a, you know, like a wide understanding of the topic or people who are, different cultures or that sort of thing what what could you tell us um first of all a deep respect for professionals because i'm a lawyer i can't be an engineer at the same time i can't be a doctor at the same time i can't be the finance Mm -hmm. person so there's Mm -hmm. that need to have the respect for different people and their different professions and to take professional advice because sometimes a hr person is telling you something because they know what the law says or they know what um it is in the area of expertise. So I, I think it's important to have a deep, deep respect for professionals and listen to professionals and professional advice. And then when it comes to diversity, different cultures, is also to respect diversity and to treat it as something that adds value uh, to organizations. Mm-hmm. So we might be different, but that difference is what then makes us uh, better because we're able to see things from a diverse point of view. We are able to build together um, something that that that, that is mm-hmm. benefiting from the diversity uh, within all of us. So, just being happy about diversity, because a lot of times you want people to be like us, to be extroverts yeah. or to be mm-hmm. the same like us. But over time, I've learned to appreciate the difference in people, mm-hmm. um, and 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 to appreciate people as they are, and to uh, just know that they bring something different to the table, and it's good to have people who are different around us. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. So this PhD in leadership and governance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, what? That's amazing. Okay, so what do you want to do with it? Uh, what do I want to do with it? Um, I started mm-hmm. doing it in 2018 uh, when I got my fourth mm-hmm. born. It was yeah one of those things I, I wanted to do. I've been wanting to tick the box. So I'm actually at the tail end. I'm, I'm, I'm finalizing my research process and I'll be um, next year in the process mm. of um, carrying out the, the research, doing the analysis, um, writing the journal articles and all mm-hmm. that. 
I've gone through two defenses so far of my concept and my proposal, and now mm -hmm. out to the field to collect data. So yeah, exciting for me. And yeah, I, I love learning. So that's why I've continued yeah. to, to learn. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so for me, it was yeah, more yeah. of, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that's also really, really helped you succeed as much as you have in your role because you're open to those challenges of learning new things all the time. Yeah, yeah. I am. I'm open to learning. Okay. I'm open to feedback. And, and yeah, so it's, it, it helps. Okay. Yeah. And I'm just I'm thinking, what about people who say, okay, I don't have time, you know. Uh, I don't have time to go back to school. I don't have time to network. I don't have time to... I mean, you sit on boards. I don't have time to sit on boards, burial, you know, I can barely, like, my job is enough. What would you tell people like those? I guess it depends on everyone's personal beliefs and, and priorities, because not mm -hmm. everyone wants a busy life. Not everyone yeah. believes that they must sit in 10 boards. So I, I wouldn't tell people sit in 10 boards or, or do things my way. I yeah. think for each of us, God has put a desire a vision, a purpose in our lives. And once we identify mm -hmm. that is, what that is, whatever it is, we should pursue it vigorously. So if your passion yeah. is to stay home and bring up your kids, please do it and do it well. If your passion That's is to sit on board, sit on as many as you can. If yours is to build a business, develop a product, do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there is um, one path for all of us. Everyone has a, a path set out for them by God. And once um, you've sort of... Um, try to figure out what your purpose is in life um, and, 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 and how you, the difference that God created you to make in this world, pursue it vigorously. Yeah, so I just yeah. believe in whatever it is you're set out to do, do it and do it with excellence and do it well. Yeah, yeah. And once you are doing it, I mean, just be content with it and the process that you have, yeah? Yeah. You're you and yes. I'm me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't have that on the wall. This is how you can be me. You're not me. Because yeah, there are things about you that I can't be, even if I wanted to. So it's, it's good to look up and to admire if that's really um, the, the path that uh, you want to take and then learn from people. But you don't have to be a duplicate of anyone in this world. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are your parting shots to us? Yeah, for those uh, aspiring and current leaders for well, joining us? <laughs> um, I think for aspiring and, and, and current leaders, I think the most important thing about leadership for me is let's use it as a place for influence for a better mm -hmm. society. Uh, because mm -hmm. as we lead, wherever we lead, uh, let's make a difference um, in the lives of others. Let's influence as much as, 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 as we can. Let's use our lives, our talents, our abilities, our yeah. skills to make the world a better place. So that, Absolutely. I think, is my advice to all of us as leaders, whether we are leading institutions, whether we are leading ourselves, because I believe also in self-leadership. Um, mm -hmm. Let's do it for uh, mm -hmm. a better world, uh, because that's why we are all here, to see the difference we can make in the short time that we are here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And on that wonderful note, I won't even spoil it <laughs> by adding anything. Yeah, I just want to thank you so much, Phyllis, uh, for joining us. Yeah, so for all of you, yeah, you can you can say thank you, Phyllis, as we close. Yeah, but I just want to thank you so much for taking the time. I know that you have another meeting that's ongoing that you have to join. But Asante Sana, for those who um, are joining us, uh, there will be a recording of this uh, probably tomorrow. I don't know how long LinkedIn takes to process um, or YouTube, but you should be able to see it tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, I want to wish you all a wonderful, wonderful Christmas, a great festive season and a happy new year. I hope that all of you will find uh, great joy in this season. Just a time of, of great reflection as well. Yeah. And as well to you, Phyllis. And you, you have you. four kids. I was like, I don't know that we yes, started the word of prayer. <laughs> <laughs> Start with the word of, I have a 16-year-old. You have 12, a 16 year old 10. And a three-year-old, wow. yes. Yeah, someone who's about to be an adult. What's that like? Yes, I do. It's amazing. It's amazing because she's a girl. So I have one girl and three boys. So she's my good friend, actually. Yeah. We we share oh, makeup, nice, clothes. 
stories. Oh. Mm, yeah, which is oh, which is wow. great. Then the rest are boys. They're also amazing. So it's it's great to be a mother. Yeah, and a wife. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that is so wonderful. That is so wonderful, yeah. and I'm so happy to have spoken to you today. All right. So to everyone, have a wonderful, wonderful evening, and God bless you all. Bye. Bye. Happy holidays. <laughs>